Hi, it's Rob West. Before we get to the podcast, I wanted to let you know that last year, more than 45,000 people searched for a local certified kingdom advisor or CKA in their area. These financial, legal, and accounting professionals have completed a certification program to give biblically wise financial advice as a part of their practice. You can find a local CKA professional in your area by going to moneywise.org and clicking the Find a CKA button on the homepage. Do you want to know a secret? Well, I have one for you today, a secret that'll change your life. Hi, I'm Rob West. Well, I hope I captured your attention. Today, I really do have a secret that is life-changing. I'll clue you in just ahead. And then our phone lines are open for your questions on any financial topic. Here's the number, 800-525-7000. We'd love to hear from you. Again, 800-525-7000. This is Money Wise Weekend. Biblical wisdom for your financial journey. So what's the big secret? Well, I'll get into that in a moment. But first, let me remind you that every so often on the broadcast, we like to circle back to first principles, to the foundational teachings of Christian stewardship that should guide our everyday lives. Usually we focus on one of the five things you can do with money. You can earn it, live on it, give it away, owe it to someone or to a business or the government. And finally, you can grow it by saving or investing. So that's earn, live, give, owe, and grow. Very easy to remember. But there is one more thing that relates to all of the others, and that is learning about money and wise stewardship. You can remember that one because learn rhymes with earn. (laughs) As Christians, we are called to be disciples. That's just another term for learner. Our task as disciples is to learn about God and how to honor Him through the way we live. Now, of course, a big part of that is learning to manage the resources He entrusts to us, including money. We can learn many practical things about money management, such as about budgeting and saving and investing and so on. But we also need to learn to have a proper attitude toward money and material things. And that's where this big secret comes in. The Apostle Paul tells us about it in Philippians chapter 4. He writes this, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with plenty or little, for I can do everything through the one who gives me strength. Did you catch that? The secret he has learned is the secret of living in every situation. Even when he doesn't have everything he might want to have, he has learned the secret of being content. Now, the reason this is a secret is not that anyone is trying to hide it. It's simply that relatively few people have applied this to their lives. We live in a discontented world in which many people never seem satisfied with what they have. Well, that's our fallen nature, I suppose, and advertisers appeal to that nature by getting us to want more. There's a car commercial running now that features a song called Gotta Have It. The message is, you got to have this new car. And when a new model phone comes out, we're encouraged to get rid of our old phones, which probably aren't that old, and get the latest and greatest. I'm not saying new things are bad, but I am suggesting that those of us seeking to be faithful stewards should take a step back and wrestle with this question of contentment. Note that Paul said he had learned how to be content. Contentment doesn't come naturally. It's something we must seek from the Lord. But I also think we need to start saying no to the cultural's continual push that tries to amplify discontent. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying you should never buy anything or that you can't spend money on a new gadget or a pleasurable vacation. What I am saying is that we need to examine our motives. Does discontentment drive our purchasing decisions? Are we envious of others because they may have more than we do? Do we think, I would be content if only I had this or that? You know, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving soon. And so there's probably no better time to be talking about the issue of contentment. 
Giving thanks is one of the ways we can practice contentment. When we say, thank you, Lord, for providing for my family and me, thank you for giving me a job, thank you that we have a roof over our heads and food on our table, we begin to realize how blessed we are. And I think that'll go a long way to helping us learn, as the Apostle Paul learned, to be content with whatever he had. As I said, becoming a good steward involves learning many practical things about effective money management. But don't neglect the attitudinal thing, learning to be content. It really is a secret that'll change your life. I'm Rob West. Thanks so much for joining us on today's program. By the way, if you have a money-related question, well, we're here to help. Call now, 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Money Wise Weekend, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Siri. What's the best way to save for college? Hmm, I'm not sure. Well, what does the Bible say about co-signing for a loan or investing for retirement? I don't know that either, but you can find those answers on the free MoneyWise app. Really? Sure. You can connect with the online community and get answers and encouragement from MoneyWise coaches. That sounds great. Siri, download the MoneyWise app. Got it. Learn, Learn more, more at MoneyWise.org. Do you feel like your hands are tied with debt, preventing you from serving God? If you have credit card debt, Christian credit counselors can help. Through our debt management program, we can get you out of credit card debt about 80% faster while honoring your debt in full. For more information on how Christian credit counselors can help, visit ChristianCreditCounselors.org. That's ChristianCreditCounselors.org. Or call 800-557-1985. 800-557-1985. Welcome back. I'm Rob West, and this is Money Wise Weekend, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. You can call us at 800-525-7000, or you can send an email to questions at moneywise.org. Hey, do you need an advisor? Are you looking for an advisor who's met high standards and character and competence, but also shares your Christian worldview? Well, perhaps you're looking for a certified kingdom advisor. You can find one on our website at moneywise.org. Just click find a CKA. All right, to the phones. Diane, how can I help you? Hi, kind of question. I've heard you talk through the years about online banking, and yeah. I'm kind of concerned. You know, I'd like to maybe try it because where my money sits now, it's not making any money. And from what I think I've heard you say that, you know, there's a little more return on the online banking. Are they safe? Are they backed by the regular FDIC as a traditional bank or credit union? Yes. Um, as long as they're backed uh, by the FDIC, so they'd be insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, um, it's the same coverage as an FDIC insured bank down the street. And any of the online banks you would be looking at would likely uh, have that FDIC insurance coverage. You could just check to confirm that. But yeah, I mean, they're all f- going to have that. And in that case, it really makes them no different than a brick and mortar bank that you might use. The reason they're able to pay, Diane, those higher, uh, you know, payouts on the savings accounts and CDs and they're able to eliminate the fees is because they don't have the added cost of the brick and mortar bank and the staffing and so forth. So it just makes it far more cost effective because you're doing business primarily through the internet and therefore they can pass along all of that savings, uh, to the customer. Um, so I would say absolutely. They are just as safe, um, not something to be concerned about. The three that I typically talk about just because I like their customer service, they have typically the best rates and, um, uh, you know, they, they're typically very highly rated in all the reviews were uh, are Marcus at Marcus.com, Ally Bank, and Capital One 360. Uh, you can uh, look at the star rating for the various banks at Bankrate.com as well. If you just wanted to see which ones get the best ratings. But in terms of the safety, um, again, they'll all be FDIC insured. And as long as you double check that, then you're not going to get any additional protections uh, or safety by using a brick and mortar bank. And can you repeat them one more time? Because I'm driving. 
Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, don't yeah, don't write anything down while you're driving. But no, um, I'm not. <laughs> uh, Marcus dot com, M A R C U S, Marcus dot com, and then Ally Bank, A L L Y, and then uh, Capital One Three Sixty. Any of those three, I think you'll find have you know great reviews and and really stellar um, you know uh, yields on their um, uh, savings accounts and CDs. Like for instance, Marcus right now is sitting at one point five percent. Uh, on their online savings account, their high yield savings account with no fees whatsoever. And that's really industry leading. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, Diane. Thanks for checking with us today. Yeah, you as well. Uh, South to Tampa, Florida. Hey, Bill, thanks for calling. Go right ahead. Appreciate your program. I've been listening to it for a short time and it's just uh, an eye opener. I know next to nothing about investing. And uh, it's really been an education. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I sold my house and uh, I had $100,000 uh, profit. Uh, my kingdom advisor had me put it in an annuity. Yeah. And I get a, uh, a fixed income every month. And uh, but last uh, statement I got, it was down to about 80. And uh, I guess I naively assumed that my capital would be protected. And uh, I'm just concerned about that. And yeah, I so, was hoping down the road that would go toward buying another home for my son and I. Yeah. And, so, yeah, I'm a little surprised. I'd want a little more detail on that to understand exactly what you have there, Bill. Um, you know, I if you put it into an annuity, there's the accumulation period and then there's the uh, payout or distribution period where, uh, you know, in the accumulation, you'd either have a fixed annuity where it has a, a fixed rate of return, so you wouldn't lose any value. You're transferring the risk to the insurance company. They're going to protect what you put into it, and then you'd get a guaranteed fixed rate return uh, each year uh, beyond that. Or you'd have a variable annuity, which has what are called sub-accounts. Think of those like mutual funds inside the annuity uh, where it's invested, and depending upon the annuity contract that you have, you may or may not be able to lose value. A lot of times they'll have a floor where you can't lose you know, value and then you get a portion of the upside, but they're complicated and they're not all created equal. So it really depends on what you have. And then, you know, if you annuitize, that's the point at which you take the amount that you had on deposit and whatever it grew to, and you convert that to a monthly income stream for your life or the life of you and a, a spouse, let's say, if you have survivor's benefits on it. And, you know, that would extend throughout the rest of your life. So uh, given the fact that this money you're planning to deploy for another purpose. I think you said you're perhaps buying another home, if I heard you correctly. Uh, you know, that would confuse me as to, you know, you put it into annuity. Why are you getting an income stream off of that now, especially if you wanted the money back and why even an annuity? So I would probably go back to the advisor and just say, can you help me clarify some of this stuff um, that I'm confused about? You know, why, if, if it's in an annuity, Am I seeing that the value is, has declined? And if, if that's not the case, can you help me understand why? And number two, given my desire to deploy this money for another purpose in a relatively short period of time, how am I going to get this money back? And how much am I going to get back? And am I going to have to pay any surrender charges or penalties or anything like that? There's just a number of questions that I have based on what you're describing here. Um, the other approach you could take, and I would absolutely start with your advisor, is to get a second opinion and have somebody else evaluate what you have here. Um, but give me your thoughts on what I've just shared there. Does that trigger any you know, thoughts or ideas on perhaps what you may have currently? Well, I, I need to ask some questions. Uh, yeah. Obviously, uh, he said, you know, no matter... When I expressed the concern, I said, "Is this an annuity?" He said, "Yes, it is." And uh, I said, "He said, no matter what, how much it goes down, you, you're guaranteed that five hundred a month. You still will get that amount." Yeah. And uh, but I, like I said, I did, I wasn't expecting to lose my capital. You know. Yeah. I go from a hundred fifty, twenty, whatever. You know, and uh, that's gone, right? 
Well, again, it just depends. I mean, I'd hate to comment on that just because, again, these these annuity contracts are tend to be fairly compli- complicated, and I'd want to understand exactly what's been done. The part that's throwing me off is why you're getting a a monthly income stream from this. If you were just looking to grow it and protect it, so you could deploy it for another purpose, uh, were you counting on that five hundred dollars a month as you know a part of your income? Why did you know he recommend you go down that road? I cut way back on my working. I still work um, uh, 69 next month, but I, I had to cut way back on my hours at work. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I think you need to ask some more questions and try to get to the bottom of this, and I'd be happy uh, to you know try to help you as well. If you want to shoot an email to info at moneywise.org and just mention that we spoke on the air, after you get some more uh, answers to your questions, I'd be happy to help you navigate this, Bill. I'm, I know, um, unfortunately, I can't give you more details just because I'm a little confused myself about exactly what you have right now. So do a little bit more digging, shoot us a note, and let's see if we can't get you some answers and help get you pointed in the right direction. We appreciate your call today, sir, and I hope to talk to you again real soon. Folks, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, more of your questions and comments right here on Money Wise Weekend. Do you ever feel stressed or anxious about money? If so, that's normal, but you don't have to accept that. You can find peace of mind and financial security. Learn how with the 31-day devotional, Money, Seeking God's Wisdom. You'll find powerful scripture and practical exercises for spiritual and financial growth. You can request your copy with a gift of any amount. Would you consider a monthly or one-time gift by December 31st? Just visit moneywise.org slash give. You probably have a strategy for your finances, your career, even your retirement, But do you have a strategy for your giving? At the National Christian Foundation, we can help you create a giving strategy to inspire your family, maximize your resources, and leave a lasting legacy of faith. To learn how, visit moneywise.org slash ncf. Moneywise Weekend is all about biblical wisdom for your financial journey. I'm so glad you can spend time with us today, and I'd love to tackle your financial questions. Here's the number, 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. We've got a lot of questions lined up, so let's go right back to the phones. Newcastle, Indiana, WGNR. Julie, you go right ahead. Hello. Um, I just wanted to... um comment on the student loan forgiveness. I have um, already applied for that, and uh, it's a very smooth process. Um, The people are very good. They walk you through everything. Uh, Mine is a teacher's loan forgiveness, Okay, and uh, they they tell you exactly what to do and how to do it, and uh, they keep tabs on you, and they um, constantly email you or send you a material in the mail to let you know where you're at and what you're doing. I did consolidate my two loans, and then I also had my employer to fill out a form, and they um, I sent that in to them. And so um, they just keep tabs with you all the way through and let you know kind of what's going on and where you're standing and, and all of that. So, so far for me, it's been a really smooth, um, um, I don't know what you'd call it, but a smooth um inquiry or whatever. I don't yeah, know what you would process. call that, but sure. it's been smooth, the process, yes, going through it. So I just thought I'd comment on that. Well, I'm delighted that you did, Julie. So you mentioned specifically uh, you were applying for the teacher's loan forgiveness. So were you at a Title I school or wh- where have you been teaching that qualifies for that? Uh, I've been at a public school teaching. Okay. All right. And um, did they tell you you're eligible for up to 5000 or uh, potentially seventeen five? Uh, well, I am retired, and okay. so um, I am eligible for the 17000 
Okay. Yeah. Very good. Well, I'm glad to hear that it was a, a good process. You know, the uh, there's been real challenges with it. It's been confusing and difficult, and the U.S. Department of Education has made a concerted effort to improve that uh, for folks uh, going through it and who specifically qualify for some of these programs that encourage teachers and others in the government or nonprofit sector to pursue jobs that are helpful because there's a lack of workers there, and therefore, in exchange for that, they will offer forgiveness after a period of time. So I uh, appreciate you weighing in, uh, Julie. That will, I'm sure, be an encouragement to others who also qualify for teachers' loan forgiveness, perhaps to uh, reach out and get the process started. Ed.gov would be the uh, place to begin. We appreciate you weighing in on the program today. Uh, let's head, uh, we'll actually stay in Indiana. Bob, you're next on the program. Go ahead, sir. Hey, Rob, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Good. I just have a uh question here. My wife and I have a considerable amount in tax deferred 401ks and traditional IRAs. Okay. And, um, knowing this, would you forego funding a Roth IRA in order to, um, do Roth conversions, you know, while the taxes are, how they'll say on sale, uh, with, you know, with money that we have outside of retirements, you know, year to year, um, you know, to basically, um, you know, did, when you do a conversion, obviously you're paying the taxes now. Uh, yes. So we, that's basic. We have one choice, either doing the Roth IRA or doing a conversion with the, you know, the money that we have. Um, what's your thoughts? Yeah. So tell me why you're kind of weighing these two options. I'm not sure kind of how one relates to the other in the sense that you've got this 401k that's tax deferred that you're sitting on. Uh, you have the ability to convert a portion of that to a Roth, but then you're also looking at contributing additional funds to a Roth. Is that really the two choices you're looking at? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, yeah I was going to say the, 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 the conversion would be strictly obviously just to get that, you know, while taxes are on sale right now, I think lower, sure. 2026, you know what I mean? Like to try to do that or, you know, like if we do both me and my wife, I think we could do like, I don't know if it's 7,000 for a Roth, you know, like um, basically we, we can only really do one where, you know, where, where that money is going in, you know, uh, I and, you see. Know, it's kind of so growing the, the same way. But yeah. So the funds that you would use to make the contribution, you would refrain from making the contribution and then reserve those for the taxes that you'd have to pay on the contribution or the conversion? Yeah, we, we only have enough to do one or the other. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's... Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And do you think you're going to need to live on this money uh, soon after retirement or is this money you could allow to continue to grow? Oh, no, this would be money definitely that we could, you know, further down the road. We, you know, I, I currently have a pension, you know, and then, you know, like I said, yeah, this would definitely be money that could grow down the road. Yeah, we wouldn't okay. need it immediately. Yeah. Yeah, I like that option. I mean, I would concur with you that uh, when taxes move, they're headed higher. And I think that fortunately, that's probably going to happen sooner rather than later. Some of that will depend on the outcome of the next couple of election cycles. Um, but clearly, I think uh, we're probably as low as they're going to go. So if you said, you know, I'm probably going to need the money, I'd say, just leave it right where it is. But uh, if you don't, this would allow you to keep it growing. Go ahead and realize the tax bite now. You would not have to take the required minimum at 72, which you would have to with the 401k or if you convert it uh, or roll it over to a traditional IRA. And because you don't need it, you could just leave this money in it and let it continue to work for you. So, um, you know, I think as long as you're working with your tax preparer to understand the implications of that, and perhaps you do this over time so you don't inadvertently push a portion of this up into a higher tax bracket, maybe you'd kind of throttle it over a couple of years just to make sure you're minimizing the taxes as much as possible. That makes some sense to me, Bob, uh, you know, given the situation of you not needing the money. Okay. So at this point, again, you'd kind of hold off on doing, you know, contributing to a Roth IRA and just focusing on that. And, you know, I think if you had to do one or the other, um, you know, it probably makes sense if you can allow it to continue to grow, you know, for quite some time. I mean, the argument against it is to say, well, you know, when you stop working, you're going to be in a lower tax bracket anyway uh, because your income is down. And so you don't want to trigger the taxes when you're in a higher bracket now if you're still working. But as long as you've looked at all of that and really what you're counting on is the tax bracket to be higher down the road, then I'd say, uh, 
uh, there's no reason not to go for it at this point. But I'd work closely with your CPA as you make that decision, okay? Sounds great. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Absolutely, Bob. We appreciate your call today. And that's going to do it for us today. And as we wrap up, let me just say thanks for being with us today. Thank you for your calls. Thank you for listening. And thanks for being a faithful supporter of this ministry. You know, beyond the broadcast, we have an entire team of contributors and coaches, and web designers and media producers working each day to develop tools and content to help you become a better biblical money manager. And none of that work would be possible without your financial support. We offer a lot of it for free, and that's only because of the generous gifts from listeners like you. If you're not yet one of our financial partners but would like to be, would you visit our website at moneywise.org and click the donate button to sign up? We'd certainly be grateful. In the meantime, please set an alarm on your phone and make plans to join us again next time. I'll be here, and I hope you will be too, for the next installment of MoneyWise Weekend. MoneyWise Weekend is provided by MoneyWise Media and by listeners like you.